भी पाँच साल हिसाब का बताया है इसको भी एंट्री नहीं कैसे चल रहा है कभी दिल्ली आना नहीं
Branding and Communication Chief of Brahma Kedan Foundation, to join us for the release of the book. Please come forward and come to a country called Childhood, a memoir. I don't know when this really happened. I heard that the music doesn't need words and the book needs only words. And when you see the title is A Country Called Childhood, when does really vocabulary happen? I think life happens first, then we work. And as we grow with our experiences and understanding, we analyze our emotions and put them in human perspective. Shavanaji saw me with her and she said, do abstract look <laughs> sat <laughs> I don't have to say more, his introduction to Now, I love this because now I'm feeling comfortable. <laughs> no, it's so important really that uh, when you read something, and so, so close to life and yet art. I just asked her that there are eight lines written on the first, the very first page. What is it? She said, I wanted to write something about the beginning and the first thing happened to her was a poem. And then I remember a line said by Bakoski, the poet, that is, one poem, the strength of a poem is equivalent to the entire Hollywood industry. So, now whether we go into the technical understanding of what did he mean, but it is the strength of other expounds of poem, we just opens layers beyond your words and beyond your comprehension. And that's where I feel is fascinating when I started reading this book. I told her, seldom do you really feel that you, you read something and you, you cry and you <coughs> laugh. And really it evokes. 
so quickly, and it's a matter of say half a page, and you you are amused, you are engaged, and there's no exaggeration what I'm saying, and that does not mean you know normally we say as a simple reading, easy reading. That's not the point. Have you seen life? And that's what fascinates me that at the age of four, how could she just see life? I mean, I don't even remember when I was four. I don't think I was ever four. <laughs> yeah, I remember life of 40, maybe. You know? It took me many years to understand what I have lived and put it across, maybe through plays. And to write, engaging book. I'll just start with this first poem, which is like, happens to a first. Eight lines, would you like to read? Because we really want her to say the first line, which will, it's an important line, we will say that, yeah? No, no, eight lines. Memory rushes back at times, pulls me by my finger, eggs me on and says, Come, oh, let's go. Inside those dark chambers, where you stood in the light, rejoicing in a life yet to be unfolded. I'll just write, uh, say two more lines because uh, she's written the book in five sections. Well, the note about the book she says it, is it's, it could have easily been named as stories from my childhood and not a memoir. And uh, what she means is her life is full of stories. And stories, I don't nurture them, they nurture me. That's what she said. So now to the prologue, and it's called the dance of songs over to Shabanaji. The dance of songs. It's getting dark in the city of Amritsar. Shops are shutting down. Street lamps come on, casting dim yellow pools of light. The rickshaws and bicycles hustle to make their way home. A handcart loaded with gun bags wobbles down the street. Even Dwarka's kite shop is winding up. The old Sardar tailor pulls his rickety shutter down, gets on his bicycle and pedals away. Shami's voice can be heard. She's urging her buffaloes home. Grubby little boys, the mochis, play outside in the gully and behind the threshold of the khata, the big iron gate, two little sisters, Bobby and Dolly, go about their lives. The scene, the scene seems like it's from hundreds of years ago, but it is actually dated back to the 1956. It's one of my earliest memories in which I am almost four years old. It's the street I remember the most, the street on which I lived. A little girl darts out of her house crying, I want to go to my mama. Come back, shouts my Saki, my nanny, from inside the big gate. No, I want to go to my mama. Your mama has gone to the cinema. You get in here at once. I will also go to the cinema, she retorts, and runs down the street. Suddenly, something stirs in the air. There's a Snuffled grunt in the sky, and the breeze changes. The sky turns red. Tin sheds begin to flap and rattle. The smell of wind on earth. It's a dust storm. Stray pieces of paper littering the ground outside the bookbinder's shop fly up and float in the air. Bicycles fall in a slow, studied motion along the wall of the cinema hall. The wooden shutter of Gyan Halvai's shop tills 
and slips out of its clamp. He stands with his arms outstretched, holding it with all his Malay lassi strength against the wind, his lungi threatening to fly out. A rickshaw puller pedals backwards and sideways. The world seems to slant at the edges. Dust storms the streets. My Sarthi's voice cuts through the mayhem. Stop, I say. Get back, girl. It's dark. The girl is not coming back. She runs all the way to the end of the street and suddenly finds herself in the middle of Katra Sher Singh Chok, in front of Regent Tokis, surrounded by huge cinema posters. The posters begin to tear from the whiplash of the wind. <laughs> Faces of actors and actresses fold up and slap against the dry whitewash of the decrepit cinema hall. Unable to keep her eyes open from the dust, wind and tears, the little girl hides her face in her sleeve. At her feet, swirl particles of dust, torn scraps of paper, bright orange and pink trimmings from the tailor's shop, and gather momentum. She stands still for a while, watching the little merry-go-round around her dotted rubber booties until her eyes fall upon something. Across the street, the plot waller is doing a thunder. He is a skinny man who sells little leaflets with the plot and songs of Hindi films printed on them. A strong gust whisks away the sepia-colored leaflets from his hands and flings them into the wind. They soar in the air, going up and up in circles, dodging the poor man's attempts to retrieve them. Tossed into the wind, the yellow sheet somersaults, now diving to his feet, now rising as if to sudden applause, he leaps and plunges by the side of the road, slapping his arms around, hurling himself as the musical notes. One leaf slips into two and two into four till the song dance about his gaunt, lanky frame. He dances with the songs, the poor plot father, trying in vain to hang on to his only means of livelihood as it slips away into the grimy air. No one notices the little girl as she stands in the middle of the chalk enthralled by the dance of songs, her large eyes fill with tears, but she forgets to cry. There you are, Marjan. My Sadi steps forward, scoops me up in one sweeping movement, lodges me onto her hip, strides down the street, and puts me back inside the house where I belong. As we enter, my grandmother rises from her chair, pointing a finger at me. No little girls from good homes ever go out to the cinemas on the street. Krishna's night of birth. So what was that night? Please read it out to us. Stormy night, it is. The night I was born. This is the night I was born. It was during the winter rains that I arrived. I was born on 3 February 1952 at the VJ Queen Victoria Jubilee Hospital located at one end of Company Bath in Amritsar. It was a very disturbed, stormy night, recalls my mama. The night you were born, it rained incessantly. I was lying in a little corner room of the hospital with you 
a tiny bundle next to me on the cot. The room was filled with water. It leaked everywhere. A cold wind blew in from the slit in the window. There was a furnace in the room, but no one was around to light the firewood. The long, sprawling corridors of the old Victorian red brick structure lay empty in the thrashing downpour. Dr. Santram Dhal, the doctor who delivered me, had wound up and left for the day. My Serbi, who managed the house and would later be my nanny, had dropped off the tiffin and returned home. So had my father, after his evening visit. The ward was dim and deserted. In the wee hours of the morning, while it was still dark, a sadhu baba came knocking on my door, said mama. But I was too weak to get up from my bed. If I did, I'd have to wade through the ice-cold, waterlogged room to get to the door. The sadhu kept knocking for a long time, begging, but I could not help him. Finally, he left, cursing. What was the curse, Mama? I would ask whenever she'd tell me this story. I don't remember, Bita, she would say. He cursed me, not you, my doll. The night I was born continues to fascinate me with all its dramatic elements, the freezing cold, the dimly lit corridors, the deserted ward, the deluge, the ominous sadhu and his curse. Thank you. My God, you know, I don't know if sometimes they say curse is a blessing. So maybe some kind of, uh, because we have lots of gods and goddesses stories where eventually the curse is working in your favor. In some other, your avatar on earth, maybe not this channel, the other channel. So I think uh, it has worked for you. With growing, we always, when we grow up, we really don't know, like, what are the feelings which we get? You know? We don't know. We Maybe because we know something gets hurt, we say we are hurt. You know, it's pain, it's bleeding. But, the inner hurt, we really don't know what is it called. And is it your own hurt or it hurts? Happens because of we see somebody experiencing it. There's a fantastic, a small incident. She can call it a story. Please read, if you can, page number four. The perfect child. We will discuss, but I just feel that before you read the book, you must know more about it since we are here. Otherwise, we always discuss, interview, questions, answers. We keep on doing all that. That you can Google it as well. So let's be here. Because book launch is supposed to be book launch. That's what I understand. I haven't written a book yet. My first proper childhood memory has to do with a boy with a bowl. One evening, Mama, along with other women, had gone to a house in the neighborhood to distribute milk to needy children. I decided to tag along to do my first bit of social work. I was little then and clung to the pallu of my mother's sari as she went about her mission of mercy. The little boy with the dark complexion was even little, littler. Just as the ladies finished distributing milk and were about to climb down, he appeared at the bottom of the narrow staircase, a small bowl in his hand, looking up expectantly. Oh no, there's no milk left, Bachi. It's all finished. The boy just stood there looking up at us, his eyes <clears throat> large and luminous in his dark face, dressed only in a dirty 
Banyan, the rest of his skinny body as naked as the day he was born. Why have you come so late, my child? Mama asked again, feeling sorry for the little one. My, my mother, he began breathlessly, panting from the effort of climbing the three steps to get inside the building. My mother did not have a katori. She had to borrow it. His eyes shone with pale anticipation. But the milk has just finished, Mama repeated, holding on to my hand. The small dark face grew darker. In that moment, at age four, I experienced a hollow feeling in my stomach as I stood looking at this tiny human being who seemed not more than two years old. In this image would remain with me for a long time to come. It was the first time I felt empathy for someone. I remember recognizing this as a new emotion. While feeling sorry for him, I was watching myself, watching the boy and feeling his pain. This perhaps was the first lesson in acting, taking a mental note of an experience and storing it away. In my later years, I would draw upon this emotion and use it in many ways. Sitting at a roadside cafe on 33rd Street in Lexington Avenue, he'd suddenly appear before me, the boy with the bowl. Sometimes I was looking at life from the top of the staircase and at other times I was the little boy with the small dark face with large luminous eyes standing at the bottom of the stairs with an empty bowl in my hand. From the beginning, I was taught to call my sister Didi, making her sound like she was much older, though the age difference between us is precisely a year and ten months. Her real name is Smithy, which in Sanskrit means smile. She had the most beautiful smile on earth, and each time she smiled, her eyes lit up like lamps. I like to think I had a great smile too. The difference was that she was oblivious of it, while I knew exactly the effect I had on people, having practiced a variety, <laughs> variety of poses in front of the mirror in the hat stand. As a girl, Didi was God's good child. In our early, chi in our early childhood pictures, I see the difference between the two of us clearly. She is the all-smiling, trusting, innocent face of humanity, and me, I have this Guess what I'm up to now? Look in my eyes. Actually, I was at a great advantage. Didi being older was the one answerable for everything, whereas I was accountable for nothing. She was the one who got reprimanded for every wrong we committed. With that innocent face of yours, you can get away with murder. She grumbled when she got annoyed with me. Mama would dress us in identical frocks, making sure we looked like sisters. During our early school days, Didi rode a bicycle with me happily perched on the back seat as she trundled all the way to school from Hall Bazaar 